Hello and good morning my fellow true crime enthusiasts. I've been seeing quite a few articles lately about how true crime podcasts are a money grub and how they take advantage or make fun of victims. And while that may be true for the occasional one here and there, I highly refute that argument. First off, I know they're not talking about me. I am not making any money and I hardly have any views in the scheme of things. And I would bet the majority of crime podcasters have another job providing most of their income. Second, and the most glaring point, hasn't the news been doing exactly that and to a much greater extent for decades now? Are we just ignoring the fact that the media has relentlessly shamed sex workers and women in general throughout murder trials and cases alike? Blaming victims for choosing a high-risk lifestyle? I honestly feel like the podcast generation, or this more recent wave of media, aside from the last podcast on the left, no offense, has been the first to show real empathy towards those who have suffered, and yeah, we post it to the internet. Okay, I just had to get that off my chest, sorry for the brief rant. How is everyone today? Are you ready to talk about some non-invasive true crime? Today, I bring you the curious case of the Kent family. My name is Eli, and this is Murder in the Morning. On June 29th of 1860, the Kent family was having a normal night in their Road Hill house on the Wiltshire-Somerset border, when suddenly, tragedy struck. The family's youngest, four-year-old Francis Seville Kent, had been abducted late that night from the nursery. Quote, so began one of the most dramatic murder cases in British history, a crime that has inspired murder mysteries of the Victorian authors Wilkie Collins, Charles Dickens, and Arthur Conan Doyle. Just as the disappearance of little Madeline McCann today produced a massive reaction among the public, the gruesome murder of Francis Kent provoked national hysteria in Victorian England, end quote. According to Murderpedia, Samuel Seville Kent was a deputy inspector of two clothing factories, and he lived with his family in a large three-story mansion called Road Hill House. They lived in a village called Road, near Trowbridge in Somerset. He had a large family, with his first wife giving him ten children, of whom only four survived, before she died in 1852. Because Samuel's wife had been ill for a long time, the young family had been looked after for several years by a governess, Miss Pratt, a voluptuous and attractive woman. Once his wife died, Samuel soon married Miss Pratt, and by 1860, his second wife, had managed to produce three more offspring and had one more on the way. One of these was four-year-old Francis Seville, a precocious favorite of his father. Because of his wife's pregnancy, Samuel felt it was once more necessary to employ a maid nurse, or a nursemaid, Elizabeth Gow, to look after the smaller members of the family. Mr. and Mrs. Kent slept in a second-floor room with a small daughter in a crib. Across the landing was the nursery occupied by Francis, a one-year-old daughter, and Elizabeth Gow. Also on the same floor was 16-year-old Constance Kent and 15-year-old William, both in separate rooms. The rooms on the top floor were occupied by the housemaid and the cook. At 7.15 the next morning following his abduction, the nurse, Elizabeth, reported the boy missing and a search for the grounds ensued. Within an hour, his body was found inside an outside restroom with his throat slashed. Authorities were called in, and an investigation began. No blood had been found in the house or in the nursery, but the window had been opened despite Elizabeth closing it before going to bed. Initially, investigators focused solely on this nurse, but having nothing to go on or no reliable evidence, they brought in their scope to the rest of the family. Detective Inspector Jonathan Witcher, then the most senior and well-known of the detectives, of the detectives at Scotland Yard questioned Constance Kent, Seville's half-brother, and William, Constance's younger brother. Witcher, quote, described as the prince of detectives by his colleagues, 
was a stout, scuffled man with a delicate manner. He was also shorter and thicker set than most of his fellow officers, according to Charles Dickens, and he had been one of the eight founding members of the Scotland Yard's detective force 18 years prior. All three initial suspects, or siblings slash caretaker, had nothing for the police. They simply wanted to know why anyone would have hurt this young, loving child. According to Murderpedia, Witcher was hindered more than helped by the local force. While carrying out his investigation, he found out that the household had an unusually had an unusually large turnover of servants. He decided to interview them all in order to get a bit of background on the household, and he learned from them that the two older children did not receive the same favor from their parents as the younger siblings did. This especially applied to Constance, who it had to be said bore a great deal of resentment. After interviewing, Con after interviewing Constance, he became more and more convinced that she had something to do with the death. The problem was finding enough hard evidence to prove it. Detective Witcher re-interviewed the servants and found out that and found out from the maid that on Monday following the murder, Constance had approached her while she was preparing the laundry to go to the local washerwoman. Constance had asked for her nightgown, telling the maid that she may have left her, left her purse in the pocket. Once they established that the gown was in the laundry, Constance asked the maid to fetch her a glass of water. By the time that the maid had returned, the nightgown was gone. Witcher surmised that Constance Kent had distracted the maid's attention so that she could remove the gown and hide it, having once established its presence in the laundry. If the gown had gone missing while it was away or being washed, then it wasn't her fault. She could account for all of her gowns. This would cover up for the fact that, in reality, she was missing a gown, a blood-stained one. Witcher concentrated his focus on this missing nightdress that was possibly blood-stained. It wasn't much, but he thought it to be a worthy lead. The local magistrates directed Witcher to arrest Constance and gave him seven days to prepare a case. Constance was released on bail, and the case was later dropped. The reaction in the newspapers was sympathetic to Constance, and Witcher was heavily criticized. His reputation faltered heavily since he could not pre prepare a solid case or give direct evidence to arrest Constance. That so-called nightdress or gown was never found, and Witcher returned with his head down to London. Quote, In Victorian era society, it was almost unthinkable that a detective could suspect and arrest a gentle-born girl of the middle class, and yet he did. End quote. Although the media was sympathetic towards Constance, the family's image had been dragged through the mud and would be forever tarnished. Even having just been victims themselves. Constance decided that it was too difficult to move back in with her family after everything. There was just too much trauma there at the house, so she moved on. However, the case didn't. The investigators were stumped. After losing their best lead and their best detective, Francis Ken's murder went cold. The Kent family eventually moved on as well and relocated to Wales. Constance moved to France where she attended nursing school. Later, she would move back to Brighton and become a nurse trainee for a church, seemingly leaving the past in the past. Eventually, five years had passed, and the Kent family had all been given up on solving the murder of their young boy. Then out of the blue, an unlikely person confessed. According to The Curious Case of Constant Kent, shockingly, in, 19, in 1865, Constance confessed to the crime, initially to her Reverend Arthur, but then he accompanied her to authorities in London with a written statement. Her motive for the killing? To exact revenge on her stepmother, whom she despised for taking the place of her mother. Convicted, she was sentenced to death for the murder of the four-year-old by hanging. Quickly, Queen Victoria stepped in and commuted this sentence to a life sentence of penal servitude. Her stepmother, ironically, died just a month later. Five years later, the public interest in the case was revived to an extent that Constance was considered the most famous woman in England, or infamous. Her likeness was even replicated in wax by Madame Tussaud, or Tussaud, Tussaud, Tussaud? Uh, uh, uh. 
Constance served 20 years of her sentence in four different prisons and was eventually released in 1885 at the age of 41. Her brother, William, a marine biologist now, he had moved to Australia seeking anonymity <laughs> and escape from the family scandals. Quote, Constance decided to follow him, reinventing herself as Ruth Emily Kay and disappearing into obscurity. Occasionally, the British press wondered what had happened to this infamous murderess, concluding that she had probably moved or died overseas, end quote. But that wasn't the case. This reinvented woman made quite a name for herself, becoming a fully trained nurse. She helped a typhoid epidemic, treated leper patients, and spent 11 years teaching at a girl's school. Not the typical aftermath you would think of of a released murderer. My guess is she was definitely trying to make up for that terrible, terrible mistake her entire life, and probably did as best as she could serving as a nurse. But no matter how many knees you tap, I cannot forgive the murder of your four-year-old brother. Hmm. Sorry. And that, my friends, is the curious case of the Kent family. I hope you all enjoyed today's little epi peppy. Let me know if you got any other Victorian era cases you'd like me to cover, because I definitely will. Alrighty, thank you all from the bottom of my heart for taking the time out of your day, and I will see you on Thursday. Okie dokie. Bye bye. Love you. Yo, yo's rule. Did you guys know that they used bat bombs in World War II? Like actual bats? I thought the war was messed up enough, but... According to berkeley.edu, quote, Napalm killed more Japanese in World War II than the two atomic blasts. Invented in 1942 by Julius Pfizer, a Harvard organic chemist, napalm was the ideal incendiary weapon. Cheap, stable, and sticky. A burning gel that stuck to roofs, furniture, and skin. Pfizer became involved in, quote, Project X-Ray, a scheme to drop millions of hibernating bats with tiny napalm time bombs stapled to their chest all over Japanese cities, where these bats would roost in the attics of homes, factories, wherever, and start uncontrollable blazes hours later. The bat bomb project was eventually canceled, but napalm did its work. 66 Japanese cities were bombed with napalm, and 100,000 people died in the Tokyo attack alone. All of this despite the army declaring that they would only engage in precision bombing against military targets and not attack civilians, which they did. End quote. Anyway, I thought that was pretty nasty and neat. Alrighty, bonus story time. Quote, she was 15. He told her he was 17, just a few months shy of 18, and they met on Instagram during the summer of 2022. The girl, who lived with her mother, younger sister, and grandparents in Riverside, kept their, quote, relationship a secret from the family. They would send voice messages through Instagram or talk over Discord, he showered her with gifts, sending her jewelry, groceries, money, and gift cards. He paid for Uber Eats and DoorDash deliveries, helped her buy birthday gifts for her friends, and telling her that he had a very good job and could pay for it all. But then he got clingy, pushy even. He was pressuring her to send nudes, which made her very uncomfortable. And right after Halloween, she broke up with him. She blocked him on Instagram and Discord, but he still found a way to send her a suicide letter. In reality, this 17-turning 18-year-old boy that she was talking to was a 28-year-old sheriff's deputy from Virginia named Austin Lee Edwards. And on Black Friday, a few weeks after the teen broke up with him, broke up with him, he drove to her home in Riverside and killed her mother, Brooke, who was 38, her grandparents, Mark and Sherry Wyneck, who were 69 and 65. Then he set their house on fire before kidnapping the teen at gunpoint. 
After getting into a shootout with the police, Edwards shot himself with his own service weapon and died. The teen was unharmed. Now, new grisly details about the incident are coming to light through a federal lawsuit that the now 16-year-old and her foster mother filed on Friday against the Edwards estate, the Washington County Sheriff's Office in Virginia, which employed him at the time, Washington County Sheriff Blake himself, and Detective William Smart, the investigator who reviewed Edwards' employment application at the agency. The lawsuit alleges violation of her Fourth Amendment rights, false imprisonment, negligent hiring, assault, battery, and other charges. Scott Perry, the teen's attorney, said the damages amount to at least $50 million. In February of 2016, Austin Lee Edwards was detained by Abdington Police in Virginia after he cut himself and threatened to kill himself and his father, who told the police the incident was spurred by Edwards' problems with his girlfriend. The incident prompted two custody orders, Edwards to stay at a psychiatric fil- f- f- facility sorry, and a court's order to revoke all of his gun rights. Perry, Scott Perry is arguing that Edwards should have never been hired and that the sheriff's office failed to interview most of Edwards' references or conduct a proper background check. If they had, they would have discovered these mental health orders and the incident. The Washington County Sheriff's Office gave Austin Lee Edwards a gun, a badge, and cloaked him with the authority of the law, said Scott Perry. He used these things to gain access to the Wyneck home and commit these atrocities. We will prove that an adequate investigation of Edwards' background would have prevented this tragedy. The teenager and her foster parents have declined interviews for this story, which completely understandable. According to the Times review of Edwards' personal file, which includes his employment application, Detective Smar chose not to interview Edward's father, who was listed as a reference, because of their close familial relationship. Smar spoke with Edward's previous employer at Lowe's, but he couldn't get hold of two of Edward's personal references or two of his neighbors. Smar also failed to look into his background information after he hit a tiny little bump in the road. In addition to Smar, the lieutenant and the captain of the Washington County Sheriff's Criminal Investigation Division signed off on Edwards' employment application, as did its personal director and the chief deputy. Smar wrote, Edwards has no criminal history or civil issues. Past and current employers speak positively of him, as well as his references. It is my belief that Edwards is hireable. Okay, Smar, you looked into one reference and failed to touch the rest. This is an account of what transpired during that fateful Thanksgiving holiday weekend, taken from the lawsuit and previous reportings by the Times. The teenager celebrated Thanksgiving 2022 with her mother, her younger sister, and her mother's boyfriend at Golden Corral. Afterward, they went to the Moreno Valley apartment where her mother's boyfriend lived and stayed there overnight. The next day, Brooke Wynack and her daughters went to Starbucks, planning to go Black Friday shopping with her boyfriend. Brooke's boyfriend. When they got back to the apartment, Brooke got a call from her mother, Sherry, or Cherie, who told her to take the call off speakerphone because they needed to talk about something serious. The New York Times reported last year that Edwards gained access to Sherry and Mark Wynack's home on Price Court by pretending he was a detective conducting an investigation involving the teenager. After getting into the Wynack's home, Edwards told Cherie, or Sherry, fuck me, sorry, to call Brooke and tell her that she and the teenager needed to come home to the house so he could ask them some questions. In order to keep this, quote, investigation from her daughters, Brooke told them that there was something wrong with their phones and that they needed to go back to their home on Price Court to get them fixed. Brooke then dropped off her youngest daughter, or her younger daughter, with Brooke's sister, Blandon, before heading home. Thank God. The teen recalled that once they got to the house, Brooke put her keys in her purse and told her to wait in the car while she went inside. The teen noticed that she didn't see her mother's dog in the window, which was unusual because the dog always perched there whenever people visited. After waiting for a while, the teen decided to go into the house. As she opened the screen door, Edwards grabbed her by the hair and pulled her inside. In that moment, she thought the man grabbing her was a telephone repairman or literally anybody else. She didn't realize it was the man who had catfished her. 
Then, she saw the bodies of her grandmother near the entryway, her grandfather next to the stairs, and her mother lying on the hardwood floor. She saw bags over their heads, taped to their necks, and their arms and their legs were bound with duct tape. The teen naturally started to scream. Edwards was wearing a gold police badge on his belt in the shape of a star. As she yelled, he pointed a handgun, which also had a star engraved on it, at her. Stop screaming, he said. She recognized his voice and put two and two together. It was the boy she had met online, who she had been talking to for months. Are you going to hurt me, she asked. I will if you keep screaming, he replied. Edwards grabbed the teen, pulled her through the house, dousing everything in gasoline from a canister he brought with him, and lit it on fire. He also opened the windows in the dorm so the flames would spread with extra oxygen, and he took the girl outside, forced her into the back seat of his red Kia Soul, and started to drive. Meanwhile, the Wynex next door neighbor saw the house on fire and called 911. Another neighbor, whose driveway Edwards had parked in, also called the police. She phoned the authorities again when she saw Edwards force the teen into his car. What wonderful neighbors. After speeding away, Edwards told the teen to pretend that she was his daughter if anyone asked. He said he was going to take her back to Virginia, and when the girl asked why he killed her family, he said that if he didn't, they would, quote, report it, and he wouldn't have enough time to escape. Report what? If you didn't kill anyone, nothing to report. Edwards also said that he was a police officer, a police officer, and that agencies, quote, need to do better background checks because he lied during the hiring process as he continued to drive towards his eventual destination of Saltville, Virginia. In the car with him was also the large bloody knife he used to stab her mom. They made two pit stops during the drive to use the restroom, but Edwards never let go of her hand. They also made a stop so Edwards could could clean the blood off of himself. He told the girl that they wouldn't stop for food until they left California and that they would drive to Virginia through Las Vegas, New Mexico, and Texas. She would have to stay in the back seat in the back seat the whole time. She would have to stay in the back seat the whole time, he said, until they got her a change of clothes. The Riverside Police Department identified Edwards through interviews with neighbors who provided descriptions of his car and video footage from their security cameras. Police determined that he was in the Mojave Desert and alerted San Bernardino County authorities, who chased after his Kia Soul. During the pursuit, Edward fired his gun through the back window of the car, causing the Kia to fill with smoke. The fuel canister, which Edwards had placed in the back seat with a teen, splashed all over her. Edward's Kia eventually drifted off the road and got stuck on some rocks under a bridge, enabling the police cars to catch up. As law enforcement closed in, Edwards told, Edwards told the teen to get out of the car. With nowhere else left to go, he turned his weapon on himself and pulled the trigger. End quote. Absolutely horrifying. Guns kill people, people. Ending on a, another downer today. Oopsie doopsie, daddy made a fucky wucky. I have to pee so bad right now, but as always, much love and thank you to each and every one of you. Okie dokie, bye bye. Love you. Oh.